you guys have not much sleep last night, traveled from wherever you are coming from, and uh, got up early, and we've been fed, and a uh, lot of presentation and content. So you're really tired. You want to go have a drink. Guess what? I'm standing between you and drinks. <laughs> so um, what I'm trying to do uh, is, uh, I'm sure you're aware of Supermicro because you've been a customer of Boston, and Boston has been a very, very close customer of Supermicro for 30 years. They could have been 31 years, but Supermicro got established a year after Boston. That was the reason. But then, what, what I want to do is um, look at, like, you know, from our optics, where we see the industry is moving, what we are trying to do to stay relevant, and how we can actually work together to support our customer base. That's the ultimate goal, right? It's not complicated, but things are changing. It requires us to change in a slightly different way, think different, and figure out a way to support customers in a way where they can benefit from the value that we bring. So with that, um, I think our friend from Cumulo just said, accelerate everything. That is the theme. And um, uh, I will try to go through this content. And we are here um, you know, later in the day. In case if you have any questions, we can talk about it. With that, first things first, uh, Supermicro as a company, uh, as I mentioned, is about 30 years. We have offices in uh, US, San Jose, California, that's our headquarters. And we have headquarters in Europe, that is in Netherlands, in Den Bosch. And we also have our uh, headquarters in Taiwan for the Asia Pacific operations. So we have three of them. And the company has been growing consistently, and it just has gone through an accelerated phase. And primarily, it is because of multiple things coming together. The pandemic is a history, and uh, we have dealt with supply cha challenges. All of you are aware of it, and how we have kind of maneuvered through that to get to where we are. And the acceptance or, and adoption of accelerated compute, which brought in the compute, storage, networking, and everything together, and be able to get to the market, actually helped us to accelerate the revenue. So from the company point of view, we started expanding our manufacturing capabilities as well as our engineering and support entities quite a bit in order to support a diverse customer base. Because again, the requirements from the customers are changing. Because it's not a straightforward compute that people are taking, sticking it in a rack, and then connecting the ethernet, and then getting it to work. All of us have been trained to work on that one, and every one of us are quite familiar, but things are changing. So one of the cool things that we are trying to do is to uh, figure out a way to bring the economies of scale, and that way we can take on any kind of a volume. It could be a very small scale, or it could be very large scale, including a hyperscale. We should be able to support that. And um, that actually made us kind of invest in more and more uh, infrastructure uh, manufacturing. Um, I'll kind of go into details uh, you know, a little further, but uh, when, you, when you start talking about liquid cooling, when you start talking about rack integration, there's a lot of investment that need to happen in terms of uh, human resources as well as the manufacturing lines in order to do that. So in, in terms of uh, rack scale total solutions, what is happening is uh, things are getting complex. I mean, there's no ifs and buts about it. You're talking about high-speed signaling. You're talking about uh, you know, HBM3E memories that you know, some of our partners talked about. You're talking about uh, PCIe Gen 5. You're talking about uh, you know, Ethernet, InfiniBand. Uh, all these things, when, you are coming, uh, when you bring it and put it together, one of the things that you will see is things can go wrong. Right? It becomes more and more important for us to validate everything before shipping. I mean, this is exactly what you know, partners like Boston have been doing for a long time. But at a scale, that actually uh, can be quite different. You know, if you take a look at the rack integration, uh, it could be different systems, and they all need to have certain uh, operating system per se. And they may have a switch that may or may not be manufact manufactured by Supermicro. All these things need to be working together and tested. That way, anything changes we'll be able to fix it uh, you know, within the company before it leaves. Otherwise, someone is spending like hundreds of thousands or a million plus dollars uh, on a single rack, and if it doesn't work, it's not good. 
So what is supermicro strength? So in case it's not clear, first of all, you know, we focus on R&D. Company has been uh, you know, primarily focusing on that for the longest time. That has been our differentiator. We are not the richest company. We are not the biggest company. We don't have the most number of people, but we do have very, very good, I would say, excellent technology. So R&D being the focus. And then we work very closely with our technology partners, be it Intel, AMD, NVIDIA, uh, and then the partners that we have seen, Micron, Kioxia, and even the software partners like Cumulo, every one of them that we work with in order to bring the latest technology and best performance, because that is what is going to bring the value for our customer base. And, uh, and if you kind of take it further, uh, you take a look at the product portfolio, we have the broadest product portfolio, and that actually helps us to size it right for the customer needs. So I'm going to speed up on this one. What is happening right now? If you take a look at uh, uh, the company, we, we are, like I, like I mentioned, this year probably we are targeting, well, last year finished, we are in a quiet period, but we have uh, told people that we are going to do at least 14 point billion and up. Let's say that was the last year, right? And if you take a look at the entire market that is accessible for us, based on what we are seeing is that if you take a look at cloud infrastructure that is still growing, it's like $75 billion, and storage, and the AI, and uh, telco, uh, IoT, embedded, edge, and all that. You're talking about roughly $300 billion, which means we're talking about 5% is where we are. Means like there is a huge, huge potential for all of us if we are able to bring the right value, if you are chasing the right customer base, and we secure a win and support them properly. So infrastructure's point, infrastructure point of view, what is changing? I mean, the power requirements are changing. The density that is required to get the right, uh, let's say, uh, solution for the customers, that is changing. And uh, the memory technologies are coming in a way, depending on which processor that you take. Um, you know, you, if you have seen that Micron presentation, they talked about MR DIMM and uh, uh, you know, uh, MCR DIMM and all these things coming up in the very near future, which actually brings some performance. But uh, if it is not valid validated, let's say, with the latest NVIDIA or AMD GPUs. So then, you are, by the time you start validating, you're already six months uh, behind. So what we are trying to do is this kind of validation that happens and bring those requirements up front and see how we can get to that solution much quicker and better than whatever else is out there. That's a differentiator. Right? Um, and then liquid cooling is one of the key things that is becoming a standard. It's a very, very painful point. Trust me on this. I'm sure you're already aware of it, but in case you're not, you will be aware of it very soon because the data centers are not ready. Data centers don't know how to manage. The infrastructure management guys are struggling with like, you know, how to handle these things if something's were to go wrong. And different vendors and different partners coming into the mix. If you were to do that, if something were to fail, how do you handle it? Right? This is very, very important, and what we are trying to do is to minimize uh, the uncertainties and make it easy to adopt, and working with our partners so that you can actually get the right support and service in order for us to uh, provide better user experience for the end user. So um, with that, you know, we can pause a little and then look at like, what accelerated compute uh, you know, is actually changing. Right? So, no matter whatever the uh, framework, no matter whatever the software, no matter whatever the applications, ultimately it requires solid hardware. If that doesn't work, nothing else matters, right? So what we are talking about here is, uh, if you take a look at it, nothing, there's not, 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 nothing complex there. You, know, you talk about compute, you talk about storage, you talk about network, you talk about GPUs. Bring it together and put some kind of a framework, you know, whether it is CUDA, TensorFlow, PyTorch, whatever it is, on top of it, you need to look at like what is the ultimate goal, right? If you take a look at Gen AI, what kind of models that you need to be running on it, and what kind of uh, um, applications that you will be preparing for, and you work backwards and see like, okay, what kind of a compute and uh, storage and networking infrastructure that you would need. So, if you, if from our point of view, we are a lot more comfortable in the bottom portion, but from the customer's point of view, they are up there. So, how do we bridge the gap is the one that is going to be the recipe for success for all of us. Right? So we need to look at and say like, okay, given this kind of a problem that you are dealing with, how do I click backwards and see this is the kind of a solution I can provide? Mind you, you will be a rock star if you are able to get the right solution to the customers like that. So then you might say, okay, you know, you, we, you always hear about large scale ones like you know, hyperscalers, the Tesla X and some of these guys uh, deploying hundreds and hundreds of thousands of GPUs, but how is it going to help us? 
the reality is that those are for the large language models. That's going to happen. That's going to be required in order for us to kind of come up with models that is going to create uh, an application framework for others to use, which basically means we are at the end of the inferencing. So inferencing, when I say end of inferencing, is we are at the, we are at the phase where we will be using inferencing a lot more than training at least our customer bases. So what does it mean? We need to look at which applications that can run and what verticals that we can approach. Looking at the demos and looking at uh, some of you, talking to some of you in terms of what markets that you're addressing, you have already been addressing different markets, you know, be it uh, you e-commerce, know, e be it, uh, uh, let's say, um, entertainment and media and um, healthcare, all these things, if you take a look at it, those are the ones that are just barely scratching the surface. So if we are talking to them and as, they, as we start looking at what is their AI adoption strategy and how do we basically go, that, go into that direction, I would say going forward in a you know, one, two, three years time frame, 70 to 80% of the market is going to be based on inferencing. Training is going to be there. The whole growth you take a look at, the CAGR of like 20, 30% year over year, that is actually going to be inferencing for the most part. So this is where I think we all have a solid, solid uh, business opportunity. That basically talks about accelerating everything, right? So when I say accelerate everything, first it needs to start with training. What are we doing with training? Training requires larger amounts of memory, high-speed interconnect between these, and be able to handle uh, the models in a large scale. That's actually going to be you know, running from tens of hundreds of thousands of GPUs, right? So if you take a look at it, we worked with every one of our partners, as I mentioned. NVIDIA, obviously, in the forefront of everything. We're talking about H100, HGX platforms. And with AMD, it's MI300X. With Intel, it's Gaudi 2 or Gaudi 3. We have all these three options for the customers. That's number one. Second thing is, um, if you take a look at, uh, from the customer's point of view, some of them like to standardize. I would like to have, you know, let's say Sapphire Rapids or Emerald Rapids or Granite Rapids, which is Intel, by the way. And then on the AMD side, I may like to have a Genoa or Turin. Guess what? We are probably the only company who have all these things are available on Intel or AMD as a processor. And not just on the current generation, but we already started validating on the next generation. So you can kind of see how do we basically leverage on the latest technologies as I you know, initially alluded to. Second thing is accelerating the inferencing part. What does it mean? So the exact same systems can actually be used for inferencing, right? It may not be the most cost effective, but it can be used. That is how it's been done for the most part today, with the exception of very, very small scale inference models where either Intel as a processor, you can just use that for uh, inferencing, or AMD for that matter. But when you start looking at a, a broader base, what is happening is like you have Superblade, which actually can do CPU only, or you can put a GPU in that, which can be used for inferencing, or you can use the one with the PCIe form factor, because not all the time you want to put like everything populated in a system, right? Especially if you're a customer base, yeah, I want to just start with one card and I want to run my applications, and as my requirements change and evolve and expand, I'm going to add more cards. That is the kind of a platform we have. Or someone is actually just starting to do in a small scale, I just am fine with a workstation. I don't need to even put it in a rack, so you have a workstation. So if you start looking at things like that, from end to end, you have a plethora of choices. But then, if you have listened to Jensen in GTC and a bunch of presentations, one of the things that you see is uh, larger memory footprint, cache coherency, if you are bringing into platforms in a cost-effective manner, that is going to improve the efficiency and also the performance of it. This is where the Grace Hopper and Grace Grace is going to come into picture, So, which is what we have pretty much every one of those. So this is a kind of an idea. And then it doesn't even stop there. If you start looking at based on the workloads and based on you know, uh, where these verticals are going to be, you have edge servers or you have something that going into the telco side, uh, something that requires uh, uh, extreme weather conditions like you know uh, support like uh, outdoor uh, outdoor uh, support whether it's a pole mount or rack mount kind of a thing and something that is fanless right um, and and if you take a look at a small uh, small form factor box so a large scale or a small scale you know uh, whether it's arm based whether it's x86 based whether it's fanless or fabulous whatever it is right so we have every one of these that we are emphasizing on and then 
this, this requires us to kind of put a lot of effort in uh, getting all of this ready and validated, right? On the compute side of it, the same story. I'm not going to go into all the details, but single socket, dual socket, quad socket, eight-way, uh, whether it is uh, embedded processor, whether it's uh, uh, you know, scalable processor, whether it's Intel or AMD or you know, Ampere, we have everything. And not just we have everything, we are preparing always for the next generation. So this way, when you're standardizing on a form factor, we try to make sure that the next generation processor, next generation memory and everything fits in the same. That way you don't have to keep on changing the platforms back and forth. The storage, storage is an absolutely important for, uh, part, right? And so the, whether it's a Gen AI models, whether it's a training or inferencing or everything, every one of them, the costliest part is the GPU and the next cost list is the memory, then comes the CPU, unfortunately or fortunately, right? So now, you start taking a look at, you want to feed those GPUs you know, uh, you know, as much as you can, which requires high performance storage. And depending on the type of models and everything, you may need uh, higher capacity also. So what we have is a combination of them. You can go with all high performance flash arrays, you can go with JBOF, you can go with JBOD, you can have a top loading storage or you can go with a hybrid storage. So this actually gives you the flexibility to use either NVMe in different form factors and uh, also in a top loading storage which is a standard three and a half inch uh, you know, um, hard disk drives. Switching. So, one of the things that has changed is uh, data centers have been stuck with like you know 10 gig and 25 gig for the longest time. But then with AI, suddenly people realized if I don't use the fastest network for uh, bringing these AI clusters, I'm totally going to be abusing these GPU systems. So uh, data centers are actually uh, figuring out a way to change their entire network topology and support for the faster Ethernet uh, as well as InfiniBand. So one thing that we have done is whether it's a 25 gig or 100 gig or 400 gig or 800 gig, whether it's InfiniBand based or whether it's Ethernet based, we come up with a combination of all these things in order for us to support a small cluster. Uh, it just could be a top of the rack switch or it could be a small cluster or it could be a very large cluster. We are able to do all that. And how does all these things come together? If you take a look at a typical cluster, this is how it's going to look, right? I mean, you're talking about some GPU servers, some compute nodes, some storage, uh, you know, either it's a, you know, fat tree or a modified fat tree, rail optimized or rack optimized kind of uh, um, you know, networking that we bring together, and it's a, you know, a two level or three level topology depending on how large the cluster is. And depending on the connectivity, you may use a DAC or you may use a transceiver and fiber and whatnot. So it, it's not rocket science, but it is something that we can actually um, work with the customer to understand what limitations are what kind of uh, uh, capabilities that they have so we can bring the right solution and configure that and be able to deploy. And not just deploy, we can actually help them to support and manage. This is where you, know, you can actually make money in the process uh, by bringing services. But this is just hardware, right? Hardware itself is not going to go that far unless you have a way to properly manage it. This is where we have invested quite a bit of time and resource in working with our partner. ISVs are basically heart and soul in bringing this hardware into life, right? So if you take a look at, uh, I mean, you heard about uh, what we have been doing with Cumulo. Similarly, you know, we have been working with a few others, uh, you can see, and every one of them, you have an option to basically take the software and integrate it like a meet in the channel type of a model so you can actually bring the right value to customers. Because some will have, like, I like to have DDN. Fine, you have DDN, you can take it. And someone says, like, you know, I don't want to have like, you know, eight or ten nodes, I want to smart, start small. Okay, Cumulo you have and you can start work with it and you can scale. So don't basically get bogged down by like, okay, what form factor, what is what. We need to understand what are the requirements and come back and start looking at uh, our options and you always will have multiple options to choose from. Uh, and that actually is your strength. You'll be able to tell based on your need, based on your capacity, based on your scalability requirements and the deployment time frame and all, I'll give you whatever the right solution for that. But then, in terms of cooling, one of the things that we have seen is, uh, uh, Air cooling is running into its limitations. Still many, 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 I would say like 95, 99% of it is still air cooled, right? But then AI infrastructure and the next generation of CPUs that are coming in with 500 plus watts is kind of forcing us to move into a direction where air cool may not actually support that. So we are going with liquid cooling, right? So liquid cooling point of view, it's something like we just did not get up one day and do that. So we've been spending a lot of time and effort on that. Standard compute, 
or the accelerated compute, we are able to support all of them. And you might say, like, okay, you know, this is kind of making it very tricky. What happens if there's a problem, right? So we've been working with cool IT, and we have our own solution. So customers always have a choice, right? The idea is to give an option for the customer so that they feel comfortable in adopting it. And you as our partners and Boston as our you know, integrator and uh, distributor, we can actually figure out what is the right solution for the customer and how to support that. And why that is important. I mean, not a big lecture, but just to kind of give you some idea. It's very simple. The heat needs to be taken away from the systems. Whether you use air conditioners and then you blow air through that and then you have high-speed fans to pull all the air out from the system and cool it. That's one way to do that. And then you take the heat and then you use cold and hot aisle containment to take it off uh, the data center. But air is less efficient when it comes to moving the heat. Liquid is a lot more efficient. But um, by bringing the liquid cooling into that, one of the things that we are able to do is um, uh, reduce the overall power consumption of the infrastructure. It may not matter. I, I, I was in a lot of customer meetings, and when I tell them this is what you're going to save, they say, like, oh, yeah, very interesting. Oh, by the way, I'm not paying the bill. The bill is paid by a different department. I just need you know, cheaper hardware. This was the case you know, not too long ago. But then things are changing as the deployment scale is getting different. And if the air-cooled solution doesn't even work, then they don't have a choice but to use liquid cooling. So uh, there are different ways to do that. Bottom line here is that uh, take, you, know, you have a cold distribution unit or a CDU that is going to take the cold water and it's going to pump through the systems and you'll have cold plate in the system which is going to get hot. The water comes back hotter and then it's going to do a, go through a heat exchanger. Externally, you have uh, you know, a, a, a chilling tower or you know, cooling tower or whatever it is where the heat exchange happens and then you have you know, cold air back. back. But, but the thing here is that these kind of systems when we are developing, we also wanted to see uh, how do we avoid even using a chiller. Because chiller also takes power and there is uh, water that's going to be needed to evaporate and uh, you know, there's going to be cost associated with it. So we kind of started looking at even warm water up to 45 degrees that you can actually bring into this so we can still cool these infrastructures. So we need to design the systems to operate at a higher ambient temperature. That way we can even put uh, warm water into that and be able to support with the liquid cooling. But that's just not it, right? So people are also going to be looking at um, using alternate ones, which is using a chiller doors, right? Uh, chill doors, water, water, rare door heat exchangers, so they can actually take the heat and then they cool it. The rest of the mechanism still operate the same way. There are going to be a lot of components in this, right? Um, let's say, for example, as I mentioned, there is a cold plate that actually sits on a system, and there is plumbing, which is like cold and hot water. There are vertical manifold that actually connects to all of these. There's a cold... Uh, and the, uh, the CDU, which basically the distribution unit for that. Externally, you have different types of heat rejection, whether it's hybrid or whether it is uh, dry or wet or whatever, right? Um, and some customers may already have it, some do not. And how do we basically work with them to bring the infrastructure readiness so they can actually you know, go with it? So this is where I think Supermicro is actually investing quite a bit, including you know, if you take a look at uh, what's happening on that, um, the cooling tower is also something that you can, one can get from Supermicro, right? Uh, this stays outside like a large building type of thing there. That is the one that think of like a massive radiator, right? Rest of it, you know, you can see the, you know, uh, the piping and the horizontal and vertical manifold, CDU, scroll plates and everything. And now, system management, uh, so yeah. So if you take a look at it in a very simpler terms, um, the system that you have seen in the demo area was a, you know, a, a ATU system. But once you switch to the liquid cooling, you don't need to have massive heat sinks, right? So then you can actually you know, cut the data center space in half and improve the efficiencies at the same time. Um, and when you're starting to deploy these systems at a large scale, and we have CDUs and liquid cooling and whatnot, then you need to have a better way of managing the systems. So it's not just the hardware part. Now we need to start looking at uh, whether I'm handling a single system or multiple systems, whether I'm going to create a pool of systems and manage it together. How do I update the firmware? How do I update the BIOS and whatnot? All of this requires management software, which you are using already, and we just added additional features to 
include CDUs as a part of it. And in addition to that, OpenBMC, for those guys who have the willingness to go work with it, we have the support for that as well. And as you can imagine, you know, one doesn't need to do any of it. They, we also expose all the uh, APIs in order for you to um, you know, manage this with your own management, or your means your customers. And, and then when you say, start taking a look at the technology um, you know, deployment side of it, what are we trying to do? So CPU portion, you're talking about the next generation Intel CPUs, Granite Rapids, from the AMD point of view, it's gonna be Turin. And similarly, on a GPU side, currently it's, uh, you know, on, uh, sorry, APU point of view, it's MI300A from AMD. That's, that's quite unique, because that's the only one out there with that kind of a functionality. And in terms of connectivity point of view, Bluefield 3 DPUs is getting quite popular. ConnectX uh, you know, 7 and ConnectX 8 is the one for uh, Infinity Band, and then you're talking about Broadcom Thor 2. You have seen the partner demoing there as well, which was 400 gig NICs. So if it, you know, one of the things that uh, we are seeing is certain size, certain smaller size clusters do not need to go and uh, you know work with Infinity Band. You can use uh, Spectrum X or Thor 2, you know, in order to have Ethernet-based clusters as well. So which makes it easier to deploy. But customers may or may not know. So we can actually go talk to them and say this is the case. You can use Infinity Band. Otherwise, you have these alternatives. And as I mentioned, the switching is available already. And flash point of view, uh, again, you have seen pretty much all of these. Uh, the difference here is that um, when you when you start looking at uh, uh, these technologies, you can you can look at the form factor, the density, uh, and the re uh, reliability of it in terms of the drive rights per day. Based on that, you can choose the right solution and you can start you know moving forward with it. And in terms of the GPUs, the B100 is the one that's going to be uh, exactly going to fit in the existing system. It's going to have 700 watts, so it's fantastic. You can use air cooled. But if you use B200, then it it, it comes in like 1,000 and 1,200 watts. The 1,000 watts we can still support air cooled. So for those data centers who do not have liquid cooling support, we can still support B200 up to 1000 watts in a 10U system, right? But the ones that have access to the liquid cooling, then we can go with B200 up to 1200 watts in a same 4U form factor. So the idea again here is we are continue to work on how to basically bring um, the efficiencies into the equation, how to extend the life cycle of a product or a form factor for the longest period of time, and how do we make it uh, uh, as early for customers to adopt. The, the, the same equation happens with Gaudi 3, right? So Intel, AMD, NVIDIA, all of them are advancing and we are working with them. And most importantly, we have to work with partners. I mean, it's not something like Supermicro alone is able to do. And that is a growing set of partners, right? You're talking about storage partners, the CPU, the networking, the software, the ISVs, every one of them. But then one thing that is not written here is the partners that are sitting here, right? So every one of you have your unique customer base and they have a requirement that may not align with somebody else. But how do we basically collaborate so we can bring the right solution for our customers? And uh, in terms of industry trends, all of us know today everybody's talking about AI without exception, including me, right? So that is where the direction is. And how do we basically uh, encash that opportunity? We can sit there and watch and see the opportunity of a lifetime, you know, walk away, or we can jump on the bandwagon and we can actually take control of the situation and bring value to customers. It's not easy. I'm, I'm saying like, okay, as if it's like a, like a snap, but in reality, we have a lot of work to do. We need to do our due diligence in terms of what are the customer problems we can solve. And if you have uh, listened to what NVIDIA's presentation this morning, um, I don't understand uh, German, but uh, looking at the slides, you can see that there's a lot of things about NVIDIA, um, you know, and NIMS services, NVIDIA, uh, you know, uh, AI enterprise licensing, and all those things when you see how the customer applications can be ported onto that, we can actually provide a solution to that. So think in those lines. And um, whether it's a storage or compute, we need to see still how it scales and how it fits into uh, the customer requirements. So we have to understand the requirement as the only way for us to you know, give a solution. And efficiencies are going to be extremely important going forward. It's easy to basically design a system, but it's difficult to design a system that's going to give top class performance with top class efficiency. So that is where the you know, equation that we are trying to figure out 
So in terms of the potential, I know that primarily you are from three different countries here, um, but the opportunities are everywhere, right? So um, we need to see uh, and learn from each other too, right? I mean, you have a partner, for example, in Switzerland, I mean, that is working on certain, uh, let's say, vertical, and uh, it could be the same thing for a different customer in a different, uh, what, you know, different uh, region. So you can kind of see, you know, how, it, uh, how to leverage on each other, because this is a partner ecosystem, right? And uh, inference market is gonna be tremendously large, and we need to see how to you know, stay relevant in that. Um, in terms of storage, I think there is going to be more and more and more storage opportunities that are going to come. People are a lot more receptive to the idea of uh, software-defined storage, so which actually gives opportunity for us to work with them and get the right solution, because that's what's going to make a tremendous difference for them. And uh, liquid cooling, we need to understand, we need to educate, and we need to help the customers to adopt, because uh, that is going to be one of the areas where you can immediately bring value, because you know how to handle the hardware, and the customers may not. And we together, I mean, you know, we can work with Boston and train you on how to do that, so that way you will be the feet in the field and bring value to customers and be a trusted advisor for them. And, um, Rack level integration services, again, it all depends on the customer, and uh, if the customer can take advantage of you know, turnkey racks, that's great. If not, you, know, you have your value to bring. Um, and um, again, market is changing, as I mentioned. Uh, it's quite a bit different from what we are used to. Unless we evolve, unless we think, and uh, unless we capture uh, things in a proper way, we will miss the opportunity. And I don't want us to miss the opportunity. There's a tremendous, tremendous potential for all of us. And think of selling a standard rack mount system versus a GPU server. I mean, your ASPs are going up already. And as things get complicated, the support and service value that you bring, and more importantly, giving them an option to choose the latest and greatest that gives the top class performance, the most efficient way, and be able to take advantage and leverage from the partners that are out there when I'm talking about technology partners. So sometimes, let's say for example, you bring an opportunity and it requires Cumulo. We may not know much more than just talking about what capacity and what not. Cumulo, resources are available, we can talk to them and we can you know, have them talk to the customers and uh, make them feel comfortable that you are bringing the right solution for them. And with that, um, we need to accelerate everything. So uh, I don't think I accelerated in terms of the speech, but uh, hopefully, hopefully it gave you some idea of you know, where things are, at least from uh, our optics, and uh, where we are seeing the opportunities for ourselves to be successful, and how to differentiate. And more importantly, I want to thank you for being customers of Supermicro and Boston. And uh, you are doing great, but I think we can do a lot better. Let us know how we can help you for you to be more successful together in the field. Thank you.